What's really good everybody? Today's topic is index fund ETF shopping and this is going to be a really quick hitter because even though we have some more planned content coming soon this week, the topic that we've been working on is taking a little while to come together. So we're taking this opportunity to get through some useful stuff that a lot of people, particularly regular retail investors, might be interested in looking into. You're watching Sekidur and this is the Kospi index ETF shopping episode. I don't know how to title this. Before we continue, I'd like to ask that you do us a favor, scroll down, like and subscribe and click on the little bell so that you know when we're releasing some Lulu. Also, this is just a quick reminder that this channel and videos like this are meant to serve the purpose of education only and should not be considered a replacement for paid financial and or legal advice. We're just here to help you navigate your way through our local stock market. Now let's get to it. I guess this is Jack Bogle week because we're going to go back to Jack for some sage advice for the average median income just trying to secure a future investor out there. This is from an interview that he did with The Motley Fool a couple years ago before his death and we'll link the full video in the description box below. Would you suggest then that somebody who's going through and evaluating a mutual fund to purchase and there are sites and services like Morningstar and others that have all of the ratings and reviews and they tell you about the manager and all the rest, would you say that the best thing that someone could do would be to remove all those factors and just rank them by fee and buy the ones that have the lowest fee. If you could do that without looking at anything else, obviously you'd end up with a number of Vanguard funds because your fees are average 0.12%. But is that a good, is that a better methodology than the average person is using to pick a mutual fund? Well, I'm tempted to say and will say, ask Morningstar. They say that their sophisticated rating system works almost as well as simply rating the funds by cost. Wow. So they have entered the confessional booth <laughs> with characteristics. This has been happening for you over one decade after another. Which next financial provider is gonna en enter the confessional booth? Well, the problem with that is this industry is run for the managers. They're the ones that put up the capital to start the management company. There's the ones that sell out to financial conglomerates. And today, you know, we have among the 50 largest mutual fund groups, we have one mutual fund company. That would be Vanguard. Now, just to build off this, of course there are exceptions to the rule. There are thousands of funds around the world and thousands of people running those funds. There are venture firms and holdings companies and the brightest investing minds that the world has to offer are running the endowments at schools like Princeton and Harvard, but as of 2018, of all the managers competing with index funds and trying to beat the market, only 3% have historically been able to do so consistently. If a fund manager beats the market consistently, they get to write books and do TED Talks and speak at Google. But in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, they're simply failing in their attempt to beat the market and get you prime returns. Now this is the case against mutual funds. See, most fund managers are actually bad at their job. But comparatively, most people are not as good as fund managers. So for the vast majority of people, it's a much more fiscally sound decision to buy the market instead of trying to beat it. If you were buying a mutual fund thinking that it could beat the market, then it would have to beat the market at a rate significantly higher so that it could account for all of the fees that you have to pay. Otherwise, you would still be making less than you would be paying since index funds tend to charge a lot less. Suffice to say, for the most part, you don't even need to make a decision about what's better for you. The math has already done that. Now that's not to say that with extensive research you couldn't pick the next Kathy Woods or Warren Buffett's or Peter Lynch's. It's just that your chances of finding that needle in the haystack that can find all of the needles in all of the haystacks may not actually be worth the work when you could just buy the entire bale of hay. Thus, index funds tend to be a lot easier, better, and just kind of more ideal for the regular investor who doesn't actually want to do all of that research anyway. Now, when it comes to the career market, you do have a number of choices of index funds. The two I'm going to focus on are the ones that I think would be most attractive to the largest number of people. You have total market index ETFs and Kospi 200 ETFs. The main difference between the two is that the former holds all of the companies, while the latter holds only the top 200. Some people prefer the Kospi 200 since it's best at mirroring the overall market score. Others prefer to purchase the total market since they include smaller companies that may not be on the 200 list but can perform extremely well. Whatever your decision, you can shop for the fund that you're looking for in the same way that we are going to demonstrate, but today we're going to focus on the Kospi 200 level. 
Now we're going to shop based on Bogle's assertion that the best way to choose a fund is to buy an index and the best way to choose an index is just to buy the one with the lowest fees. We won't be deciding what you're going to buy obviously because that's what you have to do for yourself but we're going to show you how to do it so that you can take a look and learn how to do it all by yourself. That way in the future if everything changes and there are new funds and new index funds and there are other markets you want to look into you can do it all on your own. Now. Let's do it for Kospi 200 ETFs. The first thing you want to do is go to the ETF section on Naver, check on Shijang Chisu, and search through the options. For expediency's sake, I'm going to click on the current price as most of the index ETFs will be priced at the same range since they all track the same thing. Now, as they are daily traded funds, their actual prices will change based on how much people are willing to pay for them. But given that the 200 companies in the Kospi 200 are consistent, the fund prices should be pretty similar. Now let's take a look at the top four. You have the Arirang 200, the Kindex 200, the Codex 200, and the Tiger 200. I'm choosing these because they have the largest volume of holdings, but it makes sense for you to look at all of the available options and weigh them all against one another once this video is done. Now remember what Bogle said. It's always most beneficial to buy the fund with the lowest fees. Although a hundredth of a percentile may seem insignificant to you now, remember that index investing is meant to be for the long term. Let's demonstrate this with NerdWallet's fund calculator. We'll work in dollars because it'll keep the number smaller and easier to imagine, but if you want to think of it in Korean won, just multiply it by 10. Now let's say you start with an initial deposit of $1,000. We make monthly investments of 100 which totals to $1,200 per year. If we continue this for 30 years, expecting a conservative average rate of return at 6%, then all we have to do is add in our fees. If we pay 0.04% in fees, we end up with a grand total of $105,497.95. In 30 years, you'll have paid $807.55 in fees. Now if we just change the fees a little bit, move it up to 0.05, that's 1 100th of a percent, we see that you've now got only $105,297.13. Now while that may not seem that big because the actual total is a lot bigger, that is still a total of $1,008.37 paid in fees and it's an extra $200 or an extra 25% of the fees that you would have paid if you just taken the fund at 0.01% less. Now, consider that a lot of the Kospi 200 index funds that are not ETFs actually charge around 1 or even more than 1% in fees. Just for fun, let's punch that in. And instead of losing $800 or $1,000, you're losing a full $18,000. Assuming that all else is equal, but why wouldn't it be? I mean, you're owning the same company, so it's all pretty similar. But I'm not going to tell you what to do with your dollars. It's just that if you're willing to spend $18,000 in fees instead of one or less, then I guess these videos are not for you. But anyway, back to the ETFs. When you're searching, the label you're looking for is Pond Bosu. Looking at just these numbers, we can see that Arirang charges 0.04%, the Kindex charges 0.09%, the Codex charges 0.15%, and the Tiger charges 0.05%. If these were our only options and we committed to what Jack teaches, then we would just simply buy the Arirang and be done with it. If that's you, congratulations. That's all you really need to do. For the record, the Kospi 200 index fund that charges the lowest fees as of January 20th, 2020 is the Hanaro Ibex, which charges a fee of 0.035%. Now, another number that you may enjoy looking into is that of the NAV, which stands for Net Asset Value. And this indicates the value of the index fund's underlying holdings on a per share basis. The fund's price will usually be close to the NAV because they follow the same thing, but if the fund price is lower than the NAV, then I suggest it's being undervalued. Another thing to look at between indexes is the weight distribution of their holdings. Just because they have the same holdings doesn't mean that they're held in the same way or in the same amount. Thus, if it interests you, it's not a bad idea to look up the differences between them. Generally, we've done what Mr. Bogle said. 
We've looked at the indexes and we found the ones with the lowest fees. Now, you may look around online and see that a lot of people really hate indexes, particularly the financial industry, and they like to claim that automated algorithms cannot beat human factors, intuition, and know-how, but math disagrees. I don't know about you, but my mind looks to cut inefficiencies, and most economists would agree that most fund managers are actually inefficiencies if your goal is to beat the market. In any case, if an industry's business model is built around charging exorbitant fees for subpar service, then maybe it's time for that industry to do what it's been telling every other industry in the world and that every other industry in the world is having to do when faced with superior automation, either adapt or die. Alright, that's it for me. I hope you learned something today, and if so, I hope you share this video with others so that we can all get it together together. Remember, Market cycles are incredibly difficult to time, so if you're getting in on an index, make sure that you're using money you won't need in the short term, because if we see a 30% adjustment or a stock market crash in the next couple of years, your equity won't be there when you need it. Invest wisely, and we'll see you next time.